Hi there, I'm Brendan Davis, and on behalf of my co-host Ying Lee, I want to welcome you to another episode of How China Works. This week's guest is a man named David Chung. He is the U.S. head of artificial intelligence for a company called Carewell. They are a medical device company. They specialize in devices and solutions related to cardiovascular health. And David's goal is pretty lofty, but I think it's those kind of goals that are worth pursuing. He is seeking to save the world by fixing health care. We talk in this interview a lot about how he has a extensive family history of heart issues. He has AFib himself. So this makes this topic really personal to him. He is, among other things, using these technologies to develop things such as wearables like an Apple Watch or whatnot to create an early warning system for patients. He gets into a lot of of details that I'm not going to do justice to in this intro. I want you to hear it from him first. He dropped a statistic when we were talking that kind of blew me away. You know, the U.S. is 300-something million people. Of course, China is basically 1.4 billion. Of the 1.4 billion people here in China, approximately 290 million of them, according to David, have some kind of a heart disease issue. And these are all the sorts of people who could benefit from this. So instead of waiting until you have a problem, this AI tracks your vitals, your activity, it factors in everything like your age and your diet and other health factors, and helps to give you this early warning system. It's really cool. Given my own family's history of heart-related issues, I was very curious to learn more, so I'm going to dig into this a bit. We have some links for you. I'm going to put these in the show notes, and you can also reach David on LinkedIn. He is David Chung, spelled C-H-U-N-G, and there are many David Chungs, but our David Chung is associated with the hashtag for this company, which is hashtag AIECG. AIECG. He wanted to get AI in there. So enjoy the episode. Stick around afterwards for a few quick comments. And we hope you enjoy this talk with David Chung. Welcome back to How China Works. And this is Yi Ying Li, your co host. And I'm Brendan Davis, your other co host. Today, our special guest is David Chung, who is the U.S. head of Carewell, a wholly owned subsidiary of Le Pu Medical Group. China's largest cardiovascular device and solution group, and we're so welcome, so welcome to have you here. Yes, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you, Ying Ying. Thank you, Brian. Um, Well, glad to have the opportunity to talk about how we can change the world, maybe fixing healthcare. Wow, we can't wait to hear your insights on this shared pain points and strength in advancing AI in healthcare from both countries. And we're excited. Can you tell us a little bit more about how did you get passionate about this? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a little bit a little bit about me and um, I was born in a family prevailing of heart disease and my grandfather he did pass, pass away from stroke. My grandmother had to raise my mom, sibling of five, very by her, all by herself. Hard to hard to endure years ago. And then my sister as well, she actually has congenital heart disease. Now she's lives a better life now after surgery many years ago. So that's her. And myself, I also had AFib last year. Wow. Atrial fibrillation. So to me, this is artificial intelligence dear to me and how this technology can change not only China and US and the world globally is it is important for me to succeed. Well, tell us a bit about mm-hmm. about what it is that you're doing specifically. Ingi and I have both done the reading, and she's talked to you a bit. But um, for the sake of the audience, kind of give us the snapshot, and then we're going to ask you a lot of questions to unwind it and get into the details. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm fortunate or unfortunate how I got into the position. Now I am the United States USA head of artificial intelligence. But I want to say that I do scale this technology globally. Uh, what, what this technology can do is that in United States, there are about 300 million ECG tests, which is electrocardiogram, which me- measure your electricity of your heart. 
you may be familiar with like an Apple Watch or other devices wearable mm-hmm. on your wrist that can measure your heart heart rhythm. From then on, it knows what type of disease you have, rather give you alert. Um, what China did is China took 17 years worth of patients' data and created an algorithm, artificial intelligence algorithm that can not only early uncover all these diseases from just simple ECG data, uh, it can give you alert. So it, it can be, you can wear it anywhere. It could be a watch, it could be a device, it could read any of those data. Essentially, it, re- it replaces a doctor to really more accurate. That means that um, you, sh- you potentially would know that you have heart diseases way before you get a heart attack. They, they do it to solve their own problem of 290 million patient population with heart disease. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm very proud of using that technology and it's already been pushed out to many hospitals. And, and me, I am, I'm the lucky winner of <laughs> holding, the key, holding the key to this technology in the United States that I could scale it globally. So how is the experience so far, you know, as you're the leading, you're the head of uh, this particular giant project <laughs> that you're really passionate about right now? So can you start with talking about some pain points and then we can go from there? My experience so far has been ups and down, painful and joyful. So the joyful part is that I found there's a lot of good people in America, a lot of good doctors, scientists that well aware of this technology, and they want it to be in U.S. They, they want to solve their problem. And that's a good part, and yeah, good people. And the, my pain point is there's a lot of misunderstanding between China and U.S. Uh, challenges that I couldn't really easily explain to China how the Euro, U.S. healthcare system is completely difficult. Having technology is one thing, but having technology that can actually can be adopted by the patients to benefit the patient. It's, it's a difficult task, and it, it takes a lot of patience to understand it between two countries. And me, as a middle person, I, I'm sensing all the frictions. That's, that's a challenge. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so let's start from the, the top-level challenge, probably the mentality or attitude or the so-called higher level of, uh, you know, this the whole thing that's mindset that we talk about cultural differences and, you know, the perception differences. Mm-hmm. So what what is what is that um, yeah. mindset in China when it comes to advancing this technology globally and when it comes to the U.S., what is that as well? Yeah, so as well, I can open up to more about detail about mindset. So I can give more insight about the mindset. Very fortunately, I'm Chinese. <laughs> Even though I never live a day in China, I'm Chinese. I study history. I also have the culture understanding that. What I understand is they they value technology as fast and accurate. When they, they're a builder, I, I always look at my company as a builder. They are manufacturers. They build something fast and efficient. And they expect that to be fast, efficient, low cost, and someone would buy it. Now, you know, that's their attitude. That, of course, this certainly is the right approach when you bring the technology to like a emerging market of China or underdeveloped country like Africa that doesn't have choices. They want something low cost. However, when you have this such technology, when you bring it to other developed countries such as United States or Europe, there are choices. There are competitions. So in order to make yourself shine, you actually have to present yourself in a way that's professionals and it actually has to be very easy to use. Having a fastest and lowest cost doesn't necessarily, that's the best. So, uh, you know, uh, if I'm buying a car, I want the, f- the cheapest and lowest cost. That's not everybody's mm-hmm. taste. There has to be, it has to fit the buyer's model. That should benefit the patient. Mm-hmm. So, so, so with that being said, what is the buyer model here, um, a developed uh, um, economy here, like in the U.S., when it comes to perception about this particular technology in China? Yeah, so, so my understanding is if it's China, this is fast. They're, they don't nearly have enough doctors around. And it is a single payer system. So anything is better than nothing. So when you invent such such powerful technology, everybody wants it. They just can't wait to adapt to it. In U.S., it's rather different. U.S. is not a single payer system. When you go see your doctors, uh, the doctors has many choices of what they can use, as well as a payer system by insurance company. You and I don't know how much our, our, our bill costs, typically, when you go see a doctor. The insurance company pays for it. 
So if there's no financial driver behind it to benefit the, the doctors or the healthcare system, there's no reason for them to introduce new technology, even though it might be better for the patients. That's also the pain point. And also, also you have to go through regulations, right? Um, in order to, for any service to be delivered to patients, not only you need to be FDA approved, which we already have, and you also have your technology to be integrated with the EMR, EMR system, electronic medical records. So it can be traced, it can be audited by the insurance company, and this is a vehicle how insurance company would pay the healthcare system. There were, once they pay the healthcare system, then they can pay for technology they can benefit the patients. It's a very con- convoluted process in U.S. Yeah. A lot of our focus here um, in with our Health China World show, we were trying to to bring this um, east to meets west approaches, or either you can say from the west to the east, or from mm-hmm. the east to the west. So you, I think you are a thinker on this, because through what you have been sharing with us, um, a lot of things you see in between these two countries could be happening and also there are a lot of challenges obviously. Mm-hmm. Can you just give us more details uh, at this moment at, at this moment of the day like 2019 with what's mm-hmm. going on between US and China uh, what are the top challenges at this moment that are fixable or uh, even with possible solutions ahead um, that could actually be addressed in order to make this, you know, not your personal mission to be fulfilled, but also, you know, getting better for, the, you know, the people for the two countries. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> could get addressed on that. Yeah, between this country right now, I see there's a lot of frictions where, you know, certainly hear the news about certain company being banned by <clears throat> United States for such reasons. Uh, my point of view is that China has always been China. China is starting from an industrial re- revolution 20 years ago when they tr- joined trading and the World Trade tr- Trading Organizations. So they doing themselves really well. They coming up, building themselves as a middle class right now, having their wealth, now become consumers. But in China's mind, China is always a builder. They are always a manufacturer. They create the product at the lowest price at the most economical, perfect, better. In the Western world, Western world also understand that as the country's been developed, the Western world has the strength of uh, marketing, has the strength of packaging, taking a product and to be delivered and deployable. It's, I think it is this is a challenge between the two countries that they don't they don't really. It's the conflict about each other. They should all work together. I would take well, I would take artificial intelligence for example. My my experience of working in the United States for many years, 13 years in the healthcare IT sector is that United States always have the most innovations, as of most fascinating technology and idea. The Western culture is we opportunists. We uh we we have a lot of invention, a very high tech. And however, we Frankly, to say that because it's cost inhibited to create technology, a lot of the technology is being built. The, 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 the lifting part has been built by offshore country. Let's not count China together. Let's count India. We have, we have, we have outsourcing business to go to India because it's just lower, low cost. China is the builder. You know, if you're looking at artificial intelligence, the United States has the best platform. Easy to use, plug it in seamlessly. That makes sense, intuitive. China, on the other hand, they got the best technology, meaning that they could build, they have, they can mobilize a, a thousand developer, IT developers. They can mobilize the labor to create algorithm very fast. They can mobilize all the scientists. Um, you combine them to two of them together, I think you could build a better world. You can have a better product that could be sold everywhere in the world. China is always the engine builder. Mm-hmm. U.S. is the vehicle. U.S. is perfect vehicle. Nice looking, got the wheels, got the side <laughs> mirror. So all polished, is, all uh, polished, uh, very yeah. polished. So um, th- there's no need to fight. I think the two of them working together could solve a lot of problems. Um, the first one, mo- most painfully to me in the, in it, in my fire in my heart is heart disease, and um, we I've seen enough that United States healthcare system, even Apple, would also trying to use the algorithm build something similar to China. But uh, you know, 
they have failed. Right. It just wasn't enough data. It just wasn't enough data. China has it all. So share it. Uh, it's just we'll all work together. Maybe it will solve the problem. Nice. What, what are the uh, what are the chief concerns from the U.S. side to collaborate? I mean, at this point for cardio and for other probably like major disease that we need to overcome globally and to join hands with China at this point. What are the major concerns at this point in your view? Yeah, security. Absolutely believe in security. Now, you are working with healthcare data right now, and you're working on healthcare data, talking to somebody that's 12 hours away, 1,000, 10,000 miles away, and you you know, you don't know who this person is. This could be the IT engineers. You never met them. Um, so w- human, human, uh, back to the basics to do business. People buy from people that they understand they have trust, if you agree with me. Um, and having two countries that never really sit down and talk to each other and get to know each other, you, you'll never be able to build that trust. Doesn't matter how great your technology is, doesn't gr- matter how great your engine is or how great your car looks. We're never going to piece together and sell, create a car, never. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a challenge. And But this challenge has actually been overcome before. You look at the Costco, wildly successful in, in China. China has opened his arms. Costco, come in here in Shanghai. You could be successful. But Costco spends a lot of money with Alibaba for years studying about culture of China. So uh, to the to the tiny bit. So I think it, it could it, it could be possible, but it takes time and also understanding. So both sides need to step up, understanding that there is a possibility to create wealth, prosperity, and health combined working together. Very nice. Very nice. Well, let's get at, at the risk of getting a little too nerdy. Can you get into the specifics of what you do a little bit more? Let's talk about, um, you know, for the scientifically minded, I'm curious how this actually works. As simple as that, whenever you feel like a chest pain in America, you will go to your primary care provider. They will put a machines on your chest. It's just called ECG, electrocardiogram. Mm-hmm. Put a little stickers all around your chest of wire and they'll, they'll measure the electricity uh, electricity around your chest, your heart. So that could determine what kind of disease you have. Rather, you have a supposedly a weak heart valve or something's blocking your valve, maybe a weak heart pump, maybe you're beating incorrectly, which is called AFib. So all that can be real easily measured by ECG. However, it's just very hard to read. Uh, a board certified cardiologist could get you could get up to 70% accuracy, 70 percent accuracy. And it's also very time consuming. You have to come to the doctors. It's not accessible. So what I do is that you know uh, China took a lot of these ECG data, which already diagnosed the patients. We already know what the outcome of the patient is based on this waveform on the ECG data. And they train an algorithm, a brain for say a brain for say, and then in, after you train it enough, it just knows how to read it. So you don't really need a cardiologist anymore. You can just read it any, anywhere, anytime. I was curious about uh, right now, you're talking about the company Lopu, right? Because yeah. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, David, you work for this company, um, but you know, seems that uh, for Chinese company to communicate self, you know, either or not they are truly making innovation to communicate itself globally. Uh, I'm sure you work, you're at heart of this uh, project and the heart of this witness of this dynamics every single day uh, with this Chinese company and with, you know, global uh, reaction to this particular uh, field. So what what is your take on how how could actually even the world uh, know or understand or react to, you know, um, you know, a, a technology that is coming from China that is, that is developed and on t- from there? Yeah, yeah. I think publication would be one of them that actually going to help. Um, we've seen Huawei have publication right now. They could use just a regular phone to check for eye disease. Mm-hmm. Huawei Retina AI. That's also AI. Um, you know, Huawei got the got the glimpse of coming up to the world stage because of the whole U.S. and China banning. No one really knew what whole Huawei is maybe two years ago. Now people know because 
Gary on the media. Um, same as Lipu. Lipu in China is uh, this is the largest cardiovascular device conglomerate in China. They develop a lot of technology, but um, their focus has solving their own problem first because they have so many disease patients in China. Um, I would love for them to get onto the world stage, but media would be one of them to get people awareness that such technology out there available. Because frankly, you know, I mean, to me, I I wasn't born to understand China, or everyone wasn't, because we we American, me, I'm American, so when I am only exposed to what the media offers me. Mm -hmm. But once you land in China, Beijing and Shanghai, you know it's different. <laughs> right, right. How it changed so how it changed so much. I remember it was just so smoky air, smog in the air in Beijing. It just seven years ago. Where did it go? It's clear now. Um, I was in Shanghai uh, just July, um, and it was pitch black, dark at night, walking alley of the street. You try to do that in uh, downtown LA, you will get robbed. <laughs> I don't say you get robbed. It's dangerous. <laughs> right, right. But I, I felt no fear. Uh, I don't understand why is it so safe compared to what I read, what I understand from the media. That what we are being fed by the public news is completely mm -hmm. different. The fact of the matter is, is that the technology is, is gone so fast far ahead in China. They have they were forced to do it that way. They needed the technology to, to control the population of 1.4 billion people for economy of scale. If they can use technology to save them a dollar a day, mm -hmm. the, the government save 1.4 billion dollar a day. Right, right. So so it makes sense for them to do force them to do what they do. Uh, whereas, you know, I think the, they deserve they deserve to be known about the advances. Um, also, then, but doing that, so there is a you know, the sacrifice between uh, on the citizens. Mm -hmm. I can elaborate that. I can elaborate that more a little bit. Please. You know, Chinese are hard workers. Um, when I say that, they are manufacturers and and builders. You wouldn't expect them. You wouldn't expect there's a 401k, there's a paid day off, time off, and there's also <laughs> also HR that watches you all the time, and you can take a Friday off, and all that luxury. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, they they grew up from a very poor country where mm -hmm. they had nothing, mm -hmm. nothing to eat. Now they actually have a job. It's actually for them. It's very glamorous. Uh, to to make it worse, understanding that the competition is very fierce, whereas the sacrifice is that in U.S. there's a lot of creativity. When I go to school, I'm not being forced to learn ex one, two, three, four, five at the age of three. But whereas in the country in China, I knew as well, even Hong Kong, you are being you are co always competing against each other. You, you, I'm the I'm the child that's been used by my parents competing against my neighbor's child. So I always have to be academically smarter and faster. But everyone follows the same, I would say, path of life. In inertia, I call it inertia. <laughs> yeah. You go to school, you go get a college degree. After college, you get an MBA. MBA after you get a PhD, because everybody's got a uh, uh, college degree. No, there's no more. We, you have to get a PhD. After you get a PhD, you go to work. So it's a piece of paper. Whereas in US, it's, it's more about. It's not more about academic in paper. It's more about um, the soft side of it. The soft side of uh, 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 in business, the communications, mm -hmm. the creativity intuitive and mm -hmm. how and can operate and integrate technology in a system so that's also very missing is missing and i heard about um uh huang jivei the the ceo of uh huawei talk about the same thing and the turnover is very high in china so you have a lot of college student phd to graduate of college their sole purpose is researching research and technology but once you put them in a position in a giant co corporations they're just good, good in research but if you want to put them in operations speaking engagements international business it's, it's it's hard it's hard to come by to find someone that can do that and the turnovers are very high in china in us it's just the opposite us is very creative creative 
a very open-minded business world. We are opportunists. We we love international business, and but our discipline is not as strong because uh, we're not really we weren't born that way. We we're born mm-hmm. for free, freedom, freedom to learn what you like the best. <laughs> you kind of uh, took the pinpoint. Uh, in a very balanced way, and uh, which also presents the opportunity to to learn for the, both sides to learn from each other. So speaking of this um, collaboration on AI, clearly um, there are challenges, of course, between countries in different sectors. But um, I read an article that that medicine is different. So. Um, be essentially, because think about human uh, future, we, public health does not stop at national borders. So I think it's eventually we have to face the reality that there is a lot of uh, a new type of challenges coming from the health sector. So, um, so what is your take at this point that y- you mentioned about some angles and angles of, about balanced views about both sides? They both have strength and. Uh, you know, things could be learned to learn from each other. But at this point, could you name a few possible solutions for both to start to improve a workout, to dress so that we can be closer? Yeah, from um, from the AI point, it will be China's data with a vast amount of data and labor power to create the engine. And from the USI, it will be a platform where it can be deployed in the best system. I've seen that happening between East and West. Uh, that actually has been working, especially between China and British um, company. That actually at work. Um, we could take an example would be even cars. Um, you look at Tesla. Um, great design, beautiful. Um, but also you can combine the technology of mobile swapping technology, technology and battery between China and Tesla. In U.S., you can make it a lot faster. Mm-hmm. This, this is an example. There are many technologies coming out of China right now as the administration is pushing it because they understand there's a threat of human. No one is going to live out here alive. We know that. Right. Uh, the Chinese population is aging. Um, I think they shot themselves in the foot from the single child administration idea years ago. And as the as as the country is coming out of poverty, that everyone's going into capital capitalism class, the working class, it's harder and harder and more expensive to raise a child. Same as U.S. and every other country. So the population is going to continue to dwindle um, for growth, birth. However, and as people are living longer and longer, which they I'm proud of them, they can actually extend uh, extend their life expect- expectancy in China. With a newer technology, so now you have more end of life care. You need more healthcare services. This is the same problem. It doesn't have to be heart disease. It's the same problem from every single country. Americans are aging. We're living longer. We need more medical care. China's aging. We're living longer. We need more medical care. Japan. Japan is actually <laughs> it's mm-hmm. the worst. They might even extinct in 50 years there's no one they, they passed the age of reproductions anymore they no one's mm-hmm. making it no one's making any babies in this world <laughs> um and there's also pollution everywhere in the world um i think uh, every country has the same problem but to me I, I look at healthcare. this is this is the same problem everyone has if you have a heart attack, you will have a heart attack in every single race, every single country. doesn't matter who you have. We, have, we share the same mm-hmm. problem. Without a phone, without a computer, you might live. Without a heart, without a kidney, I don't know. How, mm-hmm. much you, how much will you pay for it when, when a death comes to you in a week, in a day? How much will you pay for a kidney? Mm-hmm. But, uh, so, yeah. yeah. I, I like you what you pointed out actually it's uh, like a disease have no borders have, have no cultural differences and uh, the the issues rising up especially when it comes to life lives so in your particular uh, area at this point and you, you I'm sure you think a lot on this in the China you know the innovation in this in medical in medical uh, health care from China to which extent that um that that you think China is, it's 
is working on this particular, uh, you know, global leading uh, sector when it comes to, you know, the willingness and the capacity and the challenges. And uh, besides this, besides what Lop is doing, do you see any other area that is popping up, like from China, when it comes to this healthcare um, AI combination innovation? Oh, absolutely. Um, so China is pumping a lot of money and also technology and human power to create innovation on healthcare because they wanted they needed to solve their own problem. The problem is ten times bigger than any other country. Um, Artificial intelligent ECG data reading every one of them. This is the biggest one, of course. Heart disease is the most prevalent in every single country. Number one death, almost 18 million deaths globally. No one knows how to read ECG data, but AI can. Second thing I I also saw as that um, beside heart disease would be um, cancer. Cancer is the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, we we as as the global economy is rising, we are susceptible to Western culture of diet. <laughs> I'm sure we know that, you know, with, once in a while when we work hard at night at, at work and we just got into the, the idea of t- eating a fast food or have a, have a very bad diet. A lot, lot, and, lot of poor choices are made uh, once the yeah, sun sets dietarily. You know. Yeah, and and it is happening to many countries as well. Um, you know, if you're a bus driver, uh, you won't be cooking while driving. So um, it's the next close, closest thing to you is McDonald's, and there there goes something that's going to hurt you, and it's and it's going to hurt you eventually and catch up on you. Um, there is a lot of uh, impurity in food, but China's doing in technology in the same way. They are using technology to diagnose cancer as fast as possible. It's, um, uh, believe me, I um, mean, look at all these miners and builders that build up the entire country in China for the last 20 years. The Western media is correct. It is a mess in China. It is the dirty air. The sacrifice, when I mentioned those people were sacrificed. But uh, I think uh, they have to be sacrificed in order to build up the nation to what they are. They are, at, they are here today. But but they're doing so, a lot of people are suffering. Um COPD, diabetes, early heart disease from bad air, bad food, and it happens. And um, they are uh, they are feverishly creating technology from cancer to precision medicine, which is DNA sequencing medicine drugs for specific people, and and diabetes. They um, eyes, prosthetics, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence for environment called zero harm the environment. Zero Emission Environment Initiative. There's a lot. It's just coming up. I think they want to they want to solve the problem too, and they want to lead the world globally as that we care about our citizens. And I admire, I admire that, but they may not have the best approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, your approach doing it for that 1.4 million billion uh, populations could be a lot easier at, at adoptions. Right. It have, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be a perfect platform. Doesn't have to be, but in coming up to you want to share the same technology approach to other country, you have to adapt to their ideology or their culture of how it's what's been acceptable. Let me ask you, um, following up on that just a tiny bit, I wonder if you could give us your thoughts, sort of a crystal ball question here, okay? As you look at sort of the near to medium term, you know, three to five years out from now, and of course the pace of change. The acceleration of, of 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 all tech and especially AI is 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 logarithmic, right? It's it's not linear. Mm-hmm. So so with those caveats, though, what do you think? What are some specific sort of best case uses of this tech as applied that you're aiming for? The things that are just just over the horizon or just around the corner? Where 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 is this going? And how can we? move away from the human sacrifice model of cultural advancement into something that's more gamed out, you know, in a computer <laughs> and yeah. uh, more targeted. How can we move toward the higher uh, principle version of growth? It, uh, I will want, I mean, the best scenario of an integration, this technology with a Western company that understand the business model of how to disseminate technology like this to the patients. Uh, recently, I've done that for a company, a telehealth system company. 
uh, telemedicines where you can see your patients or doctors over the phone. Uh, that's one of them. That's one of the idea we wanted to do that. And but that's on a very small scale. It's right. 300, 300, there's 320 million population in America. So the challenge is that, you know, in technology is already there. It doesn't have to be China. I want to be I want to be clear that U.S. invented a lot of innovation in technology, too. They're AI as well. The challenge is how can it be able to disseminate and democratize it? Democratize means everyone can get it. And we all know that, you know, a CT scan, for yeah. example, did you know is around $2,000? Sure. A ECG check, AI, did you know is only around $2? $2. That's what I'm getting at. I want to find out the sales growth in implementation is, is obviously a huge part of the story. I'm curious about the practical, you know, some examples of practical benefits like that going from, you know, say 2000 to $2 for something that's a routine and life-saving procedure. What are, what are some other ways that this revolution is going to basically yeah. help improve things for us? My, my best scenario is that I will wake up tomorrow and say, Walmart, Walmart, are you building a clinical health center for everywhere in the United States? Yes. Walmart, would you like to have ECG check, check, like health check screening, right. pre preventive health checking for very mm -hmm. low cost okay. to everyone? Because th typically the population, the demographic coming to Walmart, they have more disease prevalence, the right. older generations, the 65 plus older. So Walmart, would you like to give it a try? Did Walmart say, yes, great. We'll make it super low cost and everybody can check it. So um, take a few bucks, check it, and then you'll know what's going on with your heart. So no more 911. <laughs> you can have preemptive surgeries mm -hmm. or you can tell – you democratize that and you can tell your doctor, hey, looks like uh, I have a, you know irregular heartbeat. Yes, AI says so. So um, maybe you want to take a look at it again. Right. So, so, so the, the population, everyone – Population health, right? So all the population would be more educated mm -hmm. when page when Americans are more educated, they're more educated about their own health, and they can also make a better decision. Because frankly, if I don't know, I start googling what about ECG, and then I, I'll freak out. I have all <laughs> kinds of wrong information online. Don't right. Do that. Don't do that. Right. Yeah. So this That's is the, the, this this is the evolution of the Google medical degree that so many of us are guilty of trying to get, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, it's, it's just always something about it's never it's never too much data, but it also has also about too much wrong data. Um, data right. on Google is never qualified for clinical. So it's, don't don't ever try to practice to uh, chuck down a bottle of vinegar and say they'll help you lose weight. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, so do you do you think something the in terms of the the boots on the ground applications of this sort of tech. I mean, do you envision a world where it's very decentralized, where you're not even necessarily going into the Walmart clinic, but, but you have some sort of a device at home that you like prick your finger, you know, to take a sample of blood or something. And then it's like you're interfaced with a network that does a lot of the prelim diagnostics. And then you only go to see the physician, you go to the physician with, with all this battery of information that's legit. It's not just you on Google <laughs> scaring yourself yeah. at, at late at night. It's actually a detail. Do you see something like that as practical where you're doing this at home to do sort of your, your a little bit of self-diagnosis? You're actually describing what the poo already built in China. <laughs> ah, Okay. So this is why I'm very excited because uh, the poo built a platform where it's on a mobile phone not only you can order your medicines, not only you can see your medical records, you can also have a Bluetooth to a small device, whether it's a, like an Apple Watch or their version of watch, that can monitor your heart heartbeats, all your tracking, your heart and right. abnormal beating. Whenever it tracks your alert for abnormal beating for high blood pressures, whatever reason, or even fall, because it's a gyrometer, it know, even knows that you're falling. And it alert, you know, it has an algorithm go through your phone and it will trigger the team of doctors to look at it again. Now it's, it's never AI trigger a team of, uh, of professional to look at it again. See, yes, this is a red alert. We will route it to your 911. I'll call a ambulance because looks like you have a missing heartbeat. 
you miss a heartbeat a couple of times. It's something's about to happen. 15 minutes before you get a heart attack. Um, and then, hey, no, this is actually a yellow alert. Um, <laughs> looks like you have AFib, middle of the night. Oh, yeah. Maybe, yeah, I'll connect you to a doctor right now. Which doctor do you like to choose? This is your mm-hmm. list of doctor, your primary care provider, based on your medical records. Sure. You can just click and choose, and you can talk to them over the phone, or you can just go over there with schedule right now for you. Nice. And it would already know based on – the, the data, the data would be such it would it would say this this should be your first choice. Like it would tell yeah. you, <laughs> we're, yeah, we should we're trying to connect you to Doctor Smith. Is that okay? Yes, no. Yes, they make it easy, right? So right. They 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 build something like that as a platform. They're a platform United States company that builds something similar to that. And what's behind it, it doesn't have the AI because, uh, uh, frankly, healthcare is great with technology. But think about all these data comes coming in. Mm-hmm. You know, who's yeah. going to read it? Oh yeah! Oh it. sure, sure. It, it, you, right. You got to have AI read it. You can't have. You can hire a thousand nurses <laughs> to read this data to make decisions. Well, you get into all kinds of ethical questions, which is kind of beyond the scope, probably, of this conversation and and maybe this show. But um, the reality is that you know you the more data you give up, then the more that there's the argument about how can this be used um, against you, basically. You know, we ha- you know, raising your insurance premiums. Etc. Mm-hmm. Because, because you know, pre-existing conditions. For instance, in your case, you mentioned your family history. So, pre-existing conditions can be biased against you. Is do you deal with that at all? Do you get that question in these conversations? And how do you sort of? Yeah. Uh, what what what's something you could share along those lines about answering yeah, that? That is absolutely correct. So, um, I work. This is my third company I work for that has AI. So, first one of AI with medical records. Um, second was AI actually for lawyers. We help lawyers sue hospitals. There's unethical <laughs> ambulance chases lawyers sue hospitals. That's unethical. Uh, and you're right. So I think uh, culturally, uh, I want to say that Americans are very opt- opportunist, opportunist. So what they know how to use data. We know how to use data. And it can be used unethically to the advantage pre-existing condition, conditions would actually increase the premium right. based on specific demographic. And take AI, take AI aside, that has been done for many years. AI is nothing more than just a faster computer. So mm-hmm. they've been doing that for many years already. They do that. Um, can I stop it? That would be, I can't stop it. And I, I, I cannot. It would not be, it would be above my pay grade. It would be, right, um, right, right. I would be our administration trying to do it. Sure. But culturally, culturally it's different. I, and China is rather want to solve the problem. They want to solve the problem because it's a single payer system. So um, they, they rather want to save it. They want to save the citizens because think about it for a moment that uh, when a pay, when a citizen is sick, He'll be on disability benefit. Mm-hmm. Right. He will not be working in a factory. He will not be contributing to his family. He will not be paying taxes. And that's going to hurt the economy in the long run. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The mentality of China is like, I don't want people sick. I rather want people to be healthy so you can work. The more people you can work, the more people can contribute to the economy or build stuff. Build stuff and sell it all over the world. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Whereas our, our system in U.S. Is, is a fee-for-service system, so it's different. So, great. If you have a disability, that's not really my problem because I'm a private insurance, so I don't pay for disability. Government sure. pays for it. That is, that's the biggest challenge, too. Um, that's something that um, I think our, our U- United States administration has to address the concern. Mm-hmm. And the great idea was to, just to build a team that actually – monitor and also set guidelines on how to apply AI. It's, it's a lot of ethic committees about talking about ethical AI on sure, the past. Sure, sure. Well, very nice. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. This is a fascinating topic, and I think we're probably going to need to do a follow-up with you in a couple of years as this uh, continues to evolve. Is there any place you might like to point listeners to go to learn more about you or connect or just check out the things that you're involved in, Is it whether LinkedIn or a, or a company website? Yeah, LinkedIn would be great. Um, you can find me, David Chung, in LinkedIn. But you look at all you got to do, go look for a um, hashtag, A-I-E-C-G. It's just okay. all one word. There's only, there's only one of me in that 
the has the hashtag. Nice. There. And we'll also and, put the link in the show notes for people so that they, yeah, they can't yeah. so that they can't go wrong. <laughs> yeah, and um, feel free to email me if you can post my email address, phone number, call me. I'm always like to talk. And also, cool. this technology is already available. So okay. The United States first artificial intelligent ECG platform that's connected with a telehealth system mm -hmm. is available right now oh, in okay. United States. So that's uh, very cool. Yes, yeah, the first one. So uh, what if Don't you if you are if you are a customer with this company or you a, a practice that want to add telehealth and telemedicine to your practice, the company is called VC V S E E dot com. It is a global company and it, this I put AI there so it, it enables doctors can remotely diagnose your patient through this HIPAA compliant platform. Okay. So you can get quick diagnostics. Uh, the benefit for a doctor would be, hey, you know, um, if you could find a patient early, you could get them on a better clinical pathway treatment. So you could sign up a brand new customers or members. Get them, get them a surgery, get them on a treatment. It's good for the patient. I guess it's also good for you. It, the government will reimburse for your for your pay for your service, so that's good. It's better than unable to diagnose this patient, let him walk around until a heart attack happens. So totally. that's wow. the moment. Absolutely, wow. check that out. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, thank, David. Thank you, David. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for having thank me. You. So I just have one quick thought to share as we wrap this episode up. Something that really struck me was David's candor about the challenges in both the Chinese and the U.S. medical systems and the differences, of course, between China being single payer and the way their system works versus the U.S.'s system. And really specifically, as an American, although I'm currently in China for the most part, I have seen this firsthand through family and friends, and I've had some of these issues myself. I've been lucky to be pretty healthy, although I'm a big guy. But specifically him calling out how the system in the U.S. makes the implementation of this technology extra difficult because of the profit motive and the different ways that doctors and hospitals and insurers are all intersecting with patients. So that's especially interesting to consider as we head into the 2020 presidential election and the various Democratic candidates to unseat President Trump. And many of them have radical ideas about healthcare reform. Some of them want to preserve or slightly tweak the status quo, and there's sort of everything in between. What do you think? If you want to find us and share your opinion, please visit HowChinaWorksPodcast.com. There's a contact page on the website. You can let us know your thoughts. You can also just tell us if you like the show, you want to hear more of a certain type of guest or a certain type of a show. And don't forget, during the holidays, we have our special support the show buttons, which are the donate buttons. If you wish to make a donation, there's a PayPal and a WeChat code, and those go to Inging or myself respectively, but we pool it and we will use any funds to help pay to bring you this show. On behalf of Inging Lee, I am Brenda Davis. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next week on How China Works. <laughs>